Good evening. I'm Jerry Rubin. I'm the director of the Genelia Farm Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's edition of our Dialogues at Discovery lecture series. Tonight, I'm particularly happy to be able to introduce Sean Eddy, one of our own scientists here. In fact, Sean was the very first scientist to sign a contract to come work here now probably some eight years ago when we were still under construction. So he took a leap of faith to come here. There's a lot about Sean, his background in this pamphlet, which you picked up when you came in. So I'm not going to go uh, through all that. I had a whole bunch of very interesting stories about Sean and escapades in college and things, but then I found out that his parents and his two daughters were in the audience, and I, I just felt like I had to cut all that stuff out. Sean, in addition to what you read here, is a very well-known person in the blogosphere. He's a critic of many aspects of modern science, uh, publications, um, policies, and other things, and he uh, attracts a lot of attention, both positive and negative, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to talk about that either, for similar reasons. <laughs> He's getting very agitated. So I think I better stop now uh, or uh, I may get in trouble and he may get so annoyed at me he won't give his talk. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Sean Eddy. So welcome, welcome to Genelia Forum. Some of you have probably been here before, uh, but others haven't. So I wanted to start by introducing you a little bit to the science that's going on here, and uh, also to the culture that we're, that we're trying to build. And sort of in the spirit of what Jerry just said, scientists have been complaining for a long time about their situation. Uh, this quote from Ramoni Cajal, one of the most famous of neuroscientists, and if you had a chance to walk around, you probably saw some of the pictures, some of the drawings that Ramoni Cajal did of, of neurons. This business of scientists complaining that they have too much demands on their time, oh, it's too hard to get funding, what have you, were all also true back in Cajal's day. And this is him working in his kitchen as an assistant professor in Valencia in Spain. Um, but he managed to do pretty distinguished work. Uh, science continues re regardless of these uh, sort of complaints of substandard equipment and having to work in kitchens. But what the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has done here at Genelia Farm is called our bluff. The Hughes is a medical charity that's been around since 1953, um, has an endowment, and has the freedom to uh, do what it likes in the name of basic research for the betterment of mankind, or some such words that are in the, in the sort of vision statement for the foundation. Genelia Farm is its first intramural research um, institute. This is the first building that they've actually built. Up till now, they've fund about 300 to 350 investigators at individual universities. Jerry and other people decided that academia was doing fine, but it also needed, there needed to be something else in science, especially in basic research, something that was going to look 50 years out. Who was going to do the blue sky stuff? Who was going to assemble a team of people sort of in the, the spirit of the old AT&T Bell Labs, or where many of us trained, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where the structure of DNA was solved and other things? Who was going to create a lab like this? So Hughes built this. This opened up in 2006. Many of us were recruited here just for the culture alone, the sort of dream of doing science in that style. And then what the place has decided to focus on is systems neuroscience, uh, picking up a line of research that arguably Ramoni Cajal started. There are an enormous number of questions in basic biology that remain unanswered. It's easy to forget this because the internet's full of information. It seems like we know everything. But a nine-year-old, my daughter, can ask, a question of why do we sleep? Why do we sing? Why, there are things that we just don't know. We don't study these questions here at, at, at Genelia. They are still too difficult. We look for simpler things. But they share something, which is that somehow it is built into our fundamental biology to behave the, the, way, the way we behave. And of course, that's also built into the basic biology of things that we see in our environment around us. My daughters and I, our family, watched in Leesburg a family of robins uh, grow up. This, the mother robin knows how to make its nest. The baby robin knows how to cry for food. You watch a spider building its web. It knows how to build its web. Um, 
The cicadas are coming out this year. Somehow they can count to 17 years. This is wired into their DNA. It is completely mysterious to us as biologists how a relatively small amount of DNA code manages to produce all this glorious complexity that we see in the world around us. We don't study robins here. We don't study cicadas. I wish we did. We don't study spiders. What we study, because this is what biologists do, is we look for the simplest possible organisms where we can put all of our weight, 100 years in some cases of weight, of learning how to do experiments in particular systems where we have control of a system, yet the system shows us uh, some of the behaviors that we're going after. So one of the main models here at Genelia, for example, is the fruit fly Drosophila that you probably know about. Fruit flies have an amazing array of behavior. You can watch them in your kitchen. Uh, this particular behavior is their mating behavior. And you can see them, the male, singing to the female, presenting his wing. He's vibrating it. And if we had an audio track that was sensitive enough, you would hear his song. And then after a little bit, he sees if that worked. And it didn't. And so <laughs> he tries again, goes back. She's not looking at him, so. And this is a sort of like a teen dance kind of ritual that they've got going. And eventually, this will either work or not work. So this, this courtship behavior actually goes through a particular pattern that is programmed in. They don't, have, they don't learn this. They know this um, from being born. So part one of this talk is, the level of the, the sort of answer that I'm looking for for these questions, where does this complexity come from, is that it's programmed into the DNA. So the answer I'm looking for is somewhere in the genomes, somewhere in the genes of these animals. I don't know where. There's a whole field of biology trying to study how genes encode this complexity. Now, no matter what the neuroscientists at Genelia Farm say, uh, that's where the answer is. And I'm saying that because biologists ask questions at different levels. Most of the people at Genelia Farm are studying these kind of things at a, at a higher level. They're interested in how the neural circuit actually functions. They're recording action potentials from neurons. They're visualizing the activity of the system with, with fluorescent reporters that show you which neurons are on and off. They'll ask behavioral questions about the sort of how does this animal behave in the wild. So different people are asking different questions at different levels. And I'm working at one of the most molecular levels, which is what's actually going on with the genes. OK, so what, what are genes? Let's make sure everybody's up to speed. You know what a cell is? This is an onion, a slice of onion. They have really big cells. You have them in your kitchen. If you have a microscope, you can do this for yourself, at least with a couple cheapo stains. And you can see, even under a, a, a simple light microscope, the nucleus of a cell. These two dark dots are called nucleoli. That's where the protein, the protein synthetic machinery is being made. And it's been known for a long time, since people could see these things with mic microscopes, that there's these amazing structures, these chromosomes, that when the cells divide, the chromosomes line up in pairs and then pull apart. So there's something that comes in twos that each new cell gets, gets one of. And because that's how genetics works, because Mendel showed with peas and everybody could see from, I don't know, dogs and pigeons and what have you, that there's something fundamentally binary. There's recessives and dominance. People had worked out the genetics. There was something that was really digital going on. It was pretty easy to make the association that chromosomes had something to do with genetics. And so nowadays, we can do amazing things with chromosomes. Of course, humans have 22 autosomes and two sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. We can paint them with very fancy. These are in hybridization probes, particular sequences, that we can paint the chromosomes different colors. If this person happened to have what we call a translocation, a broken chromosome, one part of it goes somewhere else. Because of the color scheme, we could see the translocation. And that's what happens in particular genetic disorders in our kids. That's what happens in certain cancers. So our technology for visualizing these chromosomes gets better and better. Each one of those is made up, of course, of DNA. The chromosomes themselves have protein bound to them, too. But the stuff that I'm interested in is the DNA. Ranging from the human chromosome 1, which is about 245 million base pairs, individual A, C's, G's, and T's. If I stretch that thing out, it would be about 3 inches long, about 8 centimeters. It's compressed, folded up in a complicated way into the nucleus of a cell. So nucleus, chromosome. And then a lot of packing that compresses it about 10,000 fold into something that's about 8 
millionths of a meter long, so about 10,000 fold smaller than if I just had it stretched out. Our chromosomes range in size from chromosome 1 to 22. They're numbered in order of size. Uh, 22 is the smallest one, only about 50 million base pairs, and about a micron in, in its, its actual chromosome. These are my chromosomes, which I'm quite proud of. That's why they look so crappy. Um, <laughs> that they're not fancy color chromosomes, but that's from, uh, from my own karyotype, which is a routine clinical test. So many people in the room probably had their karyotypes done for one reason or another. Now, down at the individual base level, of course, what's going on is the double helix. A pairing with T, C pairing with G, to make up this thing that's the sort of fundamental unit of, of, of heredity. Because you can peel that double helix apart, and because of the complementary base pairing, I can recreate a new double helix from the individual strands, and that's the basis of replication. The very moment that people recognized the structure of DNA, they understood how it replicated faithfully because of this principle of complementarity of the A's to T's and G's to C's. They got the structure via this is famous photo 51 from graduate student Raymond Gosling working with Rosalind Franklin at the time. And X-ray crystallography showed a particular low resolution pattern that was sufficient for Jim Watson and Francis Crick to intuit that the structure was a double helix, which they then went on and uh, became super famous for because rarely in biology uh, does something suddenly come together where you realize this actually explains genetics. This is why it's digital. This is why things operate in pairs. Uh, this principle of complementarity underlies the stability of, uh, of inheritance over very long periods of time since the origin of life. So that had actually been guessed at. The idea that the genome is digital information had been guessed at by Frederick Miescher back in 1892. Now, the irony here is that Miescher is the guy who discovered DNA the guy who purified it as a chemical back in the late 1800s. But what he had, he had given up on it being, the, being genetics, and he was actually betting that it was proteins, but either way, both DNA and proteins have a sequence to them. So he was writing about proteins when he wrote this to his uncle. Boy, I wonder if what's going on is there's a simple number of subunits, four in the case of DNA, 20 in the case of, of proteins, and all the complexity is coming from there just being different arrangements of these underlying units just the way we have an alphabet to express a language. And that, of course, turns out to be true, for the most part, for uh, both DNA and protein. So that means we can sequence it. That means we can actually get at whatever the code is underlying an organism. The first such sequence was done by Fred Sanger, one of our role models here at Genelia. You'll see quotes and pictures of him around Genelia if you walk around, uh, working then with Alan Coulson, who I worked across the bench from in England, and he tried to teach me cricket. We eventually decided that the rules to baseball and cricket cannot simultaneously be held in the same brain. <laughs> this is the genome sequence of bacterial virus phi X174. It fits on a slide. It's one of the few genome sequences that fits on a slide. Jerry got his PhD for 90 bases. 100, oh, sorry, I, I, under, I lowballed you. Uh, 150 bases of sequencing. I uh, did, as an undergraduate, 10,000 bases of sequencing a few years later, and the curve has been going up, up, and up. This one done in the 70s is a complete genome sequence of a virus. And the great thing is we can sort of read this. So proteins are coded by a triplet genetic code. Three bases of the DNA makes one amino acid. You start with an ATG, that codes methionine. The next guy. Somebody who knows their genetic code could tell me UCU, TCT is, I think, at serine, but don't hold me to it. And so on. You'd read in threes, and the thing that's doing the reading is a ribosome. And what the ribosome's reading is not the DNA. Well, what will happen is you'll make an RNA copy of just this region. And so if you looked in the sequence there, because this is something in E. coli, you'd find a little sequence that is called the promoter that tells a thing called RNA polymerase where to stick. And then it starts making an RNA copy, single-stranded, that includes this. Then there's another sequence that actually I can see from here, G-A-G-G-A, -G -G -A, tells the ribosome where to stick on the RNA. And then it starts making the protein, starting from that ATG. That signal, one of three triplets, is a stop, tells the ribosome to stop. It falls off. 
this thing, which I don't know, is a few, maybe 400, 600 residues long, uh, makes something that's 200 ish amino acids long, and that's one of the proteins produced by this virus. So we know that. The genetic code was worked out in the 1950s by very, very clever experiments in bacteria done by a number of people, including Sidney Brown, one of the advisors here at the farm. A bacterial virus is packed. It doesn't have a lot of extra stuff. The bright stuff are the genes of this particular virus, and in the interstices between those genes are the control sequences, telling those genes to turn on and off, either at the RNA level or at the protein translation level. So that is, there's non-coding sequence that's regulatory, telling the genes to go on and off, and then the stuff in bright are the actual coding sequences. Now, it turns out that this virus is so packed that there's an overlap between the two things. Some of the regulatory sequences are actually overlaid on top of coding sequence, and that's just how much pressure there is evolutionarily to keep this thing small. It has to fit in a very small molecular head. So genome sequence information, though, past that level, past the genetic code, has been largely recalcitrant to us figuring out sort of in any sort of satisfying sense what it means. But what we can do is we can compare different sequences against each other. And we can say, I've seen that sequence before, or I've seen a se sequence like that. And that's the same process that you would probably go through if someone presented you with a language that you didn't speak. And you say, well, I don't know what that word means, but I saw it here, and I saw it there, and I saw it there. And maybe eventually, by context, you'd be able to start working out, even if nobody taught you. It would be a long process, but you could probably do it. There are examples in uh, human intellectual history where we've had languages like that. And one of the great examples is Linear B, which was recovered from tablets in Mycenae, from caves in Mycenae. And nobody, it's a dead language. It was only on the tablets, only written. And it became a big puzzle what this language actually meant. It was cracked by statistical analysis. Coincidentally, by 1950, in 1953, the same year as the solution of DNA, coincidentally, by two men working with the data produced by one woman, uh, a somewhat flamboyant mathematician working with his sort of amanuensis who ended up writing the book about it. And just recently, if you read the Times, the New York Times, Alice Kober's obituary showed up this month. She died in the late 1940s. She had collected, she had transcribed the tablets of Linear B onto paper that she couldn't afford. So this paper was actually rescued from little scraps. There were over 200, or, I can't remember, 200 or 400,000 scraps of paper transcribing all this stuff. She did it in her copious spare time in her apartment in somewhere in the New York area. She died in the late 40s. The data was available to Ventress and Chadwick. And in a remarkable parallel to the story with Rosalind Franklin and, and Watson and Crick, uh, Ventress was then able to crack uh, linear B from that data. So Chadwick's principle, Ventress's principle, we need lots of pieces of the data. We need to have lots of things to compare. And for that, the thing that has happened in biology that's absolutely transformational is the revolution in DNA sequencing technology. So Jerry in, I won't mention the year, what was it, come on, 72 was 150 bases. By the 1980s, undergraduates were laboriously over the course of, I think it was three years, sequencing viruses of a size of about 12,000 bases. When I started as a postdoc in Cambridge, we did the first 50,000 base piece of a nematode worm genome and it's been ramping up exponentially. The Human Genome Project was finished in 2001, or at least it was declared so. We actually had some problems that we had to continue to clean up, and I was a, a sort of minor lieutenant in the Public Genome Project working at the Washington University Sequencing Center in, in, in St. Louis. The project pub was published in, in 2001 in a pair of papers from Solera Genomics, the company, and from the public project. And at that time, had we had to start in 2001 and do it again, it would have cost us about $100 million. Now, as it happens, because this curve has been going on for a long time, and because we were investing a lot of technology development and what have you, the Genome Project actually cost about a $1 billion uh, to its completion in 2001. But we were on a curve of making DNA sequencing technology better and better and better. And that curve was more or less tracking Moore's law and for, for, 
probably just completely spurious reasons. And then something happened in 2007, 2008, which was the introduction of a completely new technology. And there was actually another break in this curve that's off the charts. So the, a new technology was introduced in about 1999, 2000, that was used to sequence the Drosophila genome. It became fundamental in sequencing the human genome. Then in 2007, 2008, a new technology from a company called Illumina in the UK, uh, well, from Selexa, which was acquired by Illumina, came in and that quickly start, started dropping these prices. Now there's some magic price points here. You might have heard Angelina Jolie has been in the news in the past week for having herself tested for the breast cancer genes BRCA1 and BRCA2. For reasons that have more to do with business and politics, that is an expensive test. It costs about three or four thousand dollars to have to have yourself tested for those two genes. The cost of the entire genome is rapidly dropping toward that cost. You can currently have your entire genotype done, so that is common differences between humans, about 500,000 of them, can be read out much cheaper for about $99 on sale this week um, <laughs> at some of the companies that, that do this. And I've had mine done by one of, one of these companies. It's actually, for a recreational thing, it's quite interesting to look at. So there's sort of, I'm not going to talk much about clinical applications and clinical, clinical importance, but this is very important because for research purposes, getting your genome is already feasible, but doing it for sort of routine standard of care is now within reach. And so there's lots of policy planning going on in our administration in the US and also internationally. And what happens when this becomes routine standard of care? That if you have a cancer, your tumor already at Inova Loudon, they will do this. They will genotype your tumor as routine standard of care. But it's going to rapidly become uh, standard of care to do your genome for a wide range of, of things. And we're trying to think through and get ahead of the curve of what this is going to mean ethically um, and medically uh, to, to the U.S. population and also uh, just the world's population. It's not a lot of data. A human genome is three billion bases, three gigabytes of information. It doesn't actually compress very well. It's a pretty complicated sequence. But it fits on a DVD. Uh, we were in a competition with Solera to do the Human Genome Project. So Solera's data became my coffee coaster uh, in <laughs> sort of the way the Vikings used to drink from the skulls of their enemies. Um, <laughs> and the human is about the same size as the mouse. It's bigger than the fruit fly. The fruit fly genome is not much bigger than this talk, actually, as stored in, uh, on my Macintosh. Uh, e. coli is even smaller. A flu virus is only about 14,000 bases and sort of comparable to the size of that bacterial virus um, that I showed you. You should not look at that and think, sort of the majestic progression of complexity up the scale of evolution or something, because there's some very humbling facts about these genomes <laughs> sizes, which we're, we're sort of in the middle of the pack. And actually, this is a very serious issue in the field right now, and Jerry mentioned that a lot of people are angry at me, um, because this is something that I've been involved in, is pointing out that this remains a big problem. Uh, we like to think of the human as a perfect wonderful machine, but I'll, as I'll show you as we go through the talk, I think there's something else going on. So the onion, lungfish, these are not the records. The record is currently held by, I can't remember, some, something in the lily family, if I remember right, that's a little bit bigger than the lungfish genome. Uh, amoeba are, are enormous genomes. So why, why does genome size fluctuate all over the place? It's not too variable in the mammalian lineages, so most mammals have about a three, one to three gigabase genome. But in plants especially, genome size goes all over the place. The number of genes does not change a lot. So I didn't put the numbers up here. But humans, we think, genes are hard to define. It's sort of like counting mountains or something. You, you sort of know one when you see one. Um, uh, humans have about 20 to 30,000 genes. The fruit fly has about 20,000 genes. So in terms of gene number, these organisms are not so different in complexity. And that's a mystery that we'd like to understand. The amazing thing with this DNA sequencing revolution is we're used to, as biologists, we're used to looking at these organisms with all these, you know, they're beautiful. Um, anything from cabbage to little single cell things we can go out in the Janelia pond and catch to, you know, platypus. And now, sort of like that scene in the Matrix where suddenly, you know, uh, you can see the source code of, uh, of the universe. Uh, this is sitting on our disk. These are some of the genomes that are just sitting there. We can sort of browse, th browse through them, which is a fairly remarkable moment in history. And so I, what I want to do then for another part of the talk is sort of immerse you in this. And 
just a little bit. Uh, and, and, and I'll apologize going in that if you watch Jurassic Park or any movie that involves, you know, DNA genomes, you're going to expect to be taken through, you know, sort of flying through glowing green A's, C's, G's, and T's. And in fact, what we do is we look at these things as stupid little boxes, partly because we know so little about what's going on and partly because we're just so busy with other things, we don't make it pretty. And I'm going to show you the real data, and I'm going to walk you through, through some of the real data. And what we're going to do is we're going to start, like in that movie Powers of Ten, we're going to start a little bit big and we're going to go in. And what you're looking at, and I, this is something you can do on your laptop at home, you can do this too. All this is publicly available information. This is genome.ucsc, the Santa Cruz, uh, UC Santa Cruz, edu. This is the UC Santa Cruz genome browser. And what I've done is I've asked it to give me a chunk, this red thing, of chromosome 11. So chromosome 11 and its banding pattern, remember how those chromosomes had little black and white banding patterns. It's, its conserved banding pattern is shown across here. So it's a total of 135 million bases, chromosome 11, sort of a mid-sized chromosome. We're looking at 9 million bases of its left arm. And these in blue are all the genes, which you may or may not be able to see individual gene names. Okay? It's a crowded neighborhood. It's a little bit above average, this neighborhood. Overall in the human, there's 20 to 30,000 genes. On average, about one every 100,000 bases. Here in 9 million bases, we expect to see 90. There's maybe about twice as many. And that's typical of the human genome. Things come and go. There's a lot of heterogeneity across the genome. I'm going to narrow in on one particular gene. This is super well studied. Uh, uh, Max Perutz, another one of our role models for building uh, Genelia Farm, was the crystallographer who solved the structure of, of human hemoglobin, the protein complex in our blood that stores oxygen. And I also want to while I have the opportunity, because I'm such a digital guy, I'm such a DNA guy, I want to at least at one point to talk, remind you that biology is only digital in DNA and everything else is very messily analog. So what happens is the gene, this beautiful digital thing, after translation makes this amino acid sequence, which then folds up in a process that we do not really understand, associates here four different proteins, two in red, two in blue. And Everything in biology after that happens because proteins or whatever is sticky, and it's sticky for different stuff. Globins are sticky for a molecule called heme, which is a chemical in green, and the heme, there's four of them, if you can see the, the dimmer ones in the background, uh, binds oxygen. Transcription factors that turn genes on and off are sticky for DNA, for particular DNA sequences. The ribosome, which makes proteins, is sticky for the sequences that tell the translation system to start. So a lot of biology and how we draw our little cartoons involves one thing sticking to another thing. So that's all horrible and I don't like to think about it. What we're instead going to do is we're going to zero in on this guy. Okay, so now we zoom in 10x. Now we're looking at a little under a million bases. Now you can see more, some individual genes. Now this is sort of cool because if you can see it, you see they all start with OR. That's because what we're in is a little family of what are called olfactory receptor genes. This is the largest gene family in mammals. These are the proteins that we express in our olfactory epithelium uh, that sense different chemicals. And we have to have a lot of them because we can smell a lot of different chemicals. So the gene family, which starts from one basic structure, duplicates and expands. And then each one of those, over the course of evolution, specializes to change its, its little binding site where it's sticky and binds a different molecule that we can sense. Now, in primates, we've degenerated. So most of the genes, well, many of the genes that we see, about half of the olfactory receptors are actually dead. They're so-called pseudogenes. They're mutated and on their way out. We have about 300 to 400 that look like they're still alive, uh, real genes, and about 300 to 400 that look like they're relative, in like in the last tens of millions of years, have died. Dogs need to smell. Dogs have a lot of active olfactory receptors. Rats, anybody who watched Ratatouille knows uh, that rats uh, are, are, have an exquisite sense of smell, and they have 1,200 olfactory receptors. And so what we're looking at, beta globin is sitting in a cluster of, of a very well-known family. Now, uh, the other thing to notice is my type size is still pretty small, for which I again apologize. You're looking at real data. Um, but notice that an entire gene is a tick mark. In this, on this scale. Now, the olfactory receptors are small genes, but still, 
there's a lot of space between them. So here's one factoid that's really important about the genome, the human genome. Unlike the bacterial genomes that I showed you, the human genome and mammalian genomes in general, very little of it actually codes for protein. 2% of the human genome, as far as we can tell, codes for protein, and 98% of it is doing something else. Now, we know there's other stuff going on. There have to be promoters telling genes when to turn on. There have to be other signals telling genes how to get processed and what have you. But nobody really believed that it takes 98% of the genome to do that stuff. Actually, some people do believe that, but they're wrong. Uh, and so that's the, that's the sort of argument. This is a surprising amount of non-coding uh, DNA. OK, so now we zero in a little bit more. Type size is still small. There's still that vast swaths of stuff. But now we're zeroed in a little bit more. We can see there's one of the olfactory receptors. And now we can see, ah, the globin family itself, HB something, HBD, HB uh, can't read it, HB gamma 1 and gamma 2 over there. These are different hemoglobin genes. Again, this is a motif in evolution. The gene family duplicates and then specializes function. What the globins have to do, and this is uh, important in placental mammals like us, is that there's a fetus inside, and that fetus needs to get oxygen through the placenta. It's got to make a globin that binds oxygen tighter than the mother binds it, because it has to get the oxygen away from the globin in the bloodstream. So those hemoglobins are specialized for oxygen tension. They can, they can bind oxygen tighter. Those genes come on during development. In fact, there's two waves of them, embryonic hemoglobin and then fetal hemoglobin, that are binding with oxygen tension sufficient to, uh, to, to take it away from mom. The other thing I want to show you on this is this line I've now introduced on this slide. This little thing that looks like a, a tiny little heartbeat, what that's measuring is, is we compare 46 different mammals that have the same body plan, we expect to broadly share the same genes. What we're asking is, how conserved is the DNA? How often is, has the DNA stayed the same relative to what we expected from just neutral evolution, if things were just sort of moving at the expected rate, if there was no pressure on the sequence to stay the same. And anywhere where this deviates upward, there's a little signal that says there's something important going on there. Now at this scale, you see the little deviations. That's an olfactory receptor. That's a globin gene. That's a globin gene. That's a globin gene. That's a globin. That's a globin. That little signal is telling us, actually pretty robustly if I blew up the scale, telling us where the important bits are. And the point here is most of the genome is flatlined. So it looks like most of the gen genome is not doing something that's important, at least across 46 mammals. As we zero in, you'll see that this is not just the coding regions of these genes, but also their regulatory regions. So the regulatory regions are set showing up in this kind of analysis, but most of the genome does not. So that's another mystery. Average across the whole genome, this number is soft because it's a quantitative thing. I, I can set my threshold at different levels. I could say, I'm only going to look at really highly conserved stuff. I'm going to look at anything that I can statistically detect about above background. This number will vary between 5 and 20 percent, depending on who's publishing the experiment. So call it 10 percent. About 10 percent of the genome seems to be under constraint somehow. It's important functionally on an evolutionary time scale. And so there's more non-coding conservation than there is coding. And this was recognized the moment that we, actually it's been known for a long time, but it was recognized systematically in mammalian genomes the moment we had the mouse genome in 2002, following on from the human in 2001. So again, it looks like there's a lot of the genome that's evolving in a way that it looks like it's not important for, for our function. So now, zero in again. We go down another tenfold. We're now looking at 9,000 bases in the browser. Now we can sort of see the structure of a gene. This is one gene in the picture now. And now I see that there's different size boxes. And what's going on here is that those bigger boxes are so-called exons. That's the actual RNA sequence that's going to get made to specify the protein sequence of the globin. Sitting in between them, these lines, are what are called introns. That's stuff, RNA, that's going to get made, but it's going to be cut out and thrown away. And when that was found, that blew people away in the 1970s to find that genes were discontinuous. It was like reading the newspaper and having it being interrupted by advertising. What is the stuff that's in the middle getting thrown away? RNA splicing was happening to put mature mRNAs together. And that was not seen except in very special circumstances in bacteria, but as a general feature of, of larger genomes that they have, have these introns. And these sort of medium-sized boxes are the 
so-called untranslated regions. There's a leader and there's a trailer on every mRNA, and those often do contain regulatory information telling the RNA where it's supposed to go, how it's supposed to be translated. You can see the conservation here, again, on the, on the exons. And then we see some other very boring-looking looking boxes that are actually biologically quite important. These boxes, which I've labeled in red, they're not labeled in the browser, have the names L1 and ALU. These are related to viruses. The ALU element is about 300 nucleotides long. L1 is basically is a virus about uh, 6,000 bases long. And it turns out we're infested by them. You might have heard the name transposon. So Barbara McClintock, working in corn, was the first to show that there were genes jumping in genomes, capable of replicating themselves. And this shows up in corn because if it, the transposon jumps at the right time, you can get different colored kernels because there's a somatic, sort of during the development of the ear, there's a mutation that changes the genetics of the individual piece of tissue. And corn's a great readout for that because you get the different colored things. Flowers also show you this beautiful pattern when transposons hop in them. Humans, transposons will jump in us and sometimes cause a mutation that's harmful, but it's not as spectacular as, as, as what McClintock saw in corn. But nonetheless, we have these things and we have a heck of a lot, heck of, a lot of them. And if you're going to say, you know, there's coding, there's conservation, what is most of our genome made of? Most of our genome is made of the decaying remnants of these virus relatives. They are hopping, they're moving, they're sort of creatures of their own accord. It's difficult to get rid of them. We actually have a bunch of molecular biology that's trying to suppress them, control them, and delete them. But they're infectious. Like this, they're, they're viruses, but they're, they live in our genomes rather than somewhere else. One of them, ALU, comes in a million copies. And by computational methods, by reconstructing the evolutionary history of this, we can tell that the initial ALU invaded primate genomes about 65 million years ago and started expanding. A few of those are still alive today and still cause mutations, but most of them are dead and they're just decaying at some rate. Line one is another element. I showed you L1. It accounts for 17% of our genome. And then there's a bunch of smaller families that account for another chunk of our genome. We can recognize computationally that about half of the genome is made up visibly of the remains of these things. And because they're decaying away, we expect that some other fraction of them is also, some other fraction of the genome is also stuff. So you might have heard of the term junk DNA. This is what people mean by junk DNA, that the majority of our genome seems to be made up of stuff that's not conserved by evolution not coding for protein, and derived from these things that have been hopping around. So it's functionless for us, but at one time it was very important for ALU because that's its, that's its lifestyle, but not important for us. Okay, now we zero in all the way, and now there's not much to say about this except that now we're all the way down to the individual exons of the gene. It happens to be going the other way. Sorry for confusing you, but this is the, the real data. That the, this Darn browser is difficult to, to look at in the other direction. So it's showing me the wrong direction for, for most people's perspective, right to left. Exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3 is off, off the scale. What the transcriptional, the RNA synthesis machinery is going to do is make an RNA that includes all the introns. That'll get spliced out, and it'll assemble this thing. It's a 600 base final mRNA that then the ribosome sees and, and is going to translate to protein. Now you can see the conservation track is spiking out stuff over here. Those are some of the control signals for turning this gene on as, as an RNA. And even in the intron, there's little spikes. So the signals for turning genes on are, you, well, in textbooks, it's said that they're upstream, but in fact, they can occur anywhere. And in fact, can occur quite far away from the gene, which sort of complicates our business uh, in trying to figure out which regulatory elements go with which genes, because they can act at a, at a distance. So now I'm down to 90 bases. I'm looking at exon 1. The first 30 amino acids of beta globin would be coded by this DNA sequence. Okay? And I've got it from human. And the way we analyze it, so now back to Alice Cover, we're going to collect a lot of examples and we're going to line them up and we're going to say what's conserved. Well, between us and chimp, there's hardly any difference. Us to chimp, it's about a 2% difference. You to me is about one in a thousand difference. We wouldn't see any change most likely, but we're different at about a 0.1% level within the population. From us to chimp at about 2%. So there's a one change in 100 right there. And now if I go, oopsie, 
If I go to mouse and rat, I see more changes. They're further away from us in evolutionary time. Mouse and rat, if you look at the changes, of course, mice, mice and rats are pretty related. Many of these changes are shared between them, and some are not. The number of changes is giving me some sort of rough clock. It's giving me information about how far separated in evolutionary time these things are. And by comparing the sequences of, in this case, seven little pieces of sequence, but I can do it now with thousands because of the power of DNA sequencing, I can build up a lot of information about what the structure of the evolutionary history of this sequence family is. And in fact, in this particular family, like a lot of families, I can carry this particular exercise all the way back. Software developed in my lab and other labs can carry this on back all the way to bacteria. Bacteria have oxygen binding proteins that are descended from the same common ancestor as our hemoglobins. And you can see that, even though we think that that's about two to four billion years of, of evolutionary time. And so then we can use mathematical methods to say, okay, given the changes, do I have to send you out? Uh, we can look at the number of changes and we can build trees. And these trees reflect to some extent, just the closeness of the sequences. And you could do that to anything. That you know, this is more similar to this. You could do that, I don't know, uh, people have Pandora on your laptop. That's what Pandora does with music. You say, well, this artist is close to this artist in the style of music. They don't have to be related by common ancestry. You can always cluster anything that's similar. But in this case, there's more information than that. It happens I actually built this tree from the 90 nucleotides. 90 nucleotides isn't much information. This is actually a real problem technologically. We need lots of data to build these trees accurately. And in this particular case, it switched the order of fish and birds relative to what we actually think. We think the fish diverged about 400 million years ago, 450 or so, and chickens at about 300 million years ago from us. But an important point on this kind of phylogenetic tree is this is not just a clustering by similarity. This has a real hypothesis behind it. We really believe that this sequence existed in a common ancestor. And that means given sufficient sequences out here on the leaves, I can actually infer what the sequence was back at this point in the tree. And people are doing that. Joe Thornton's lab at Oregon, a Howard Hughes investigator out in the field, as we say. Uh, Oregon counts as the field for Hughes, uh, is working on this kind of thing. You can reconstruct ancient sequences. You can make them in the lab. And you can show that they function. And you can study their functions. We're not synthesizing dinosaurs. We're synthesizing individual proteins. But what that lets us do is study the steps of how, you know, when you do one of these gene duplications, does that happen because the original protein had both functions, and then you duplicated and they specialized? Or was it because it had one function, and then after the duplication, one of them assumed a new function? And those kind of things can now, have now become experimental questions. So things that we thought would require a time machine are now, by a combination of mathematics and synthetic DNA technology, have become experimental evolutionary questions. We can do this for all of life. And the diversity of life that's out there is astounding. This is you, Homo sapiens, on this tree, which includes bacteria and archaea, which you might not have heard of, which is a group of other single-celled creatures, and the eukaryotes, the things with nuclei here. That tree is so broad that pretty much everything you see is out on this little branch. So that's mushrooms, that's corn. The other things on here, giardia, which you do not want to get, uh, various things are related to, to eukaryotes and then the bacteria further away. But because there's some genes that are very highly conserved, we can see this across great gulfs of time. We believe on relatively soft, somewhat specious numbers that there's something on the order of 10 to 100 million species on the planet. About 4,000 of them are sequenced now, and we're on an exponential ramp. We're going to sequence essentially everything in the biosphere within our lifetimes. And then what that means is that for the major model systems at Genelia, the mouse and the fly, we have the number of instances that Ventris talked about and his colleagues for cracking linear B. We can reach into the mammalian lineage and pick out now hundreds of genomes that we can use for comparisons. And for the fruit flies, though you probably haven't heard any of these names, we can do the same thing for fruit flies that have been isolated from all over the world. We might not be necessarily interested in exactly what's going on in one of these, though I think there's someone in the room who probably is. Uh, I'm interested in Drosophila melanogaster for the most part. But what we do is we use that digital information to compare to melanogaster and study what seems to be important in melanogaster and how it evolved. All right, so that's what we're capable of doing. And finally, I want to tell you 
sort of where we are now and where we're trying to go, especially my lab, a computational genomics lab, in the context of Genelia Farm, a systems biology, a systems neuroscience place that's trying to study how neurons work. The problem is everything I've told you is as if there's one genome and one kind of cell. And we've known since Cajal that, of course, there's lots of different cells. There's livers, there's brains, there's what have you. But within your brain, there's nobody knows how many different cell types. Each one of them specialized for a different function. Each one of them expressing a different set of genes. So typically, even though we have 20,000 genes in total, if I reached into any single cell, it would be making only about 10,000, only about half of your genes. And if I reached in and randomly chose another, it would also be expressing 10,000 genes, and they wouldn't be the same genes. To a large extent, the differences between those cells, what makes a liver cell a liver cell, what makes a brain cell a brain cell, and what makes individual neurons play their individual roles in a, in a circuit that's doing some behavior, is down to what gene battery, what set of genes it's expressing. Those genes can be amazingly powerful. One gene, twin of eyeless in this case, when expressed in the legs of the fruit fly is sufficient to kick off the entire sequence of eye development. So you are looking at a leg, but it's growing eyes in some sort of Frankensteinian sense. And all the genes downstream of twin of eyeless are sort of in harness to it. It's a so-called master transcription factor. Once you kick that switch, a cascade of things happens. It expresses a bunch of other genes, which kick off a whole developmental sequence that makes that eye. That's a relatively unusual thing to get such a clean phenotype, but that's the kind of thing that's, that's going on. So we believe that in order to understand how genomes are creating this complexity. We don't need just the genomes. We don't need just the sequence comparisons. But we need to be able to see a single genome turning genes on and off in individual cells. If you come back or if you've been to other Genelia Farm things, you'll hear a lot about that, that kind of stuff. And I just want to say a little bit, which is to say that the technology for doing those kind of experiments is starting to exist. This is a movie from a former graduate student of mine, Jerong Bao, work that he's done at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. You're looking at a nematode embryo, cells dividing their nuclei in green. And what's about to happen in red is a gene turn on. And we can actually see that in, in real time in a live embryo. This is a gene called Fa4. It's involved in making the gut. And that's why it's down the middle of the animal. So we can imagine now for every gene in this animal, we could walk through and produce one of these movies that showed it turning on. What just happened was the animal wired up its muscles. The moment that C. elegans wires up to its nervous system, its muscles, it starts to spin in its, in, its, in its eggshell. And there's this amazing, so John Solston, one of my postdoctoral advisors, did the lineage of this animal. And there's a remarkably dry statement in the buried in the paper that says, after the 400 cell stage, the neurons wire up to the muscles, and it becomes substantially more difficult to follow the lineage of this animal. And you can see why. The imaging technology, though, is advancing very, very rapidly. And now these are results from HHMI Genelia Farm, from Philip Keller and his colleagues here. This is available to you online, uh, and anybody at www.digital-embryo.org. This is part of Drosophila development. And using technology called light sheet microscopy, while the animal's alive and while the animal's developing, we can see the entire thing. Each one of those blue dots is a nucleus. You can see that different nuclei have different sizes. We believe that we'll be able to track all of these. We believe that we'll be able to see genes turning on and off with, in them by imaging technologies coupled with other things. We believe we're going to be able to see this animal play out in space and time as it expresses its genetic program. And that's going to be key to trying to figure out how these things work. So sort of in summary, and I'm going to leave this up here looping, that's where we are. The genome community, my community, has figured out how to sequence genomes in bulk. And just recently, we figured out how to apply, the community has figured out how to apply imaging technology and genome sort of biochemistry technology to get at individual cell types in these animals. And this is the, the, the sort of frontier of research is we're going to be able to see in live animals the program at work. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to take questions.
So the, the experiment he's referring to is what Craig is, Craig Venter was the, the founder of Solera Genomics that did the private genome project. And his next, well, the, there was a gig of following that of sailing around the world on his yacht collecting samples, which was fabulous. And now the new thing is a company called Synthetic Genomics, which is based out of San Diego and has a, an office that used to be here in Maryland. Um, what Craig and Ham Smith, a fabulous scientist working with Craig, have figured out how to do is to synthesize entire genomes. Um, this is controversial in the field because Craig likes to be controversial. Um, but it's an incredibly important technology development uh, sort of demonstration that we're capable of making genomes of the size of bacterial genomes and capable of putting them inside of a cell and capable of getting that cell to kick out its old genome and replace it with the new genome. The question that's controversial in the field with, with that project is how useful that's going to be. A scientist from, say, DuPont would tell you, we're already doing this. We don't have to synthesize the whole genome. The odds that your whole genome is going to work are essentially zero. What Craig actually synthesized was the wild type sequence of mycoplasma. But if the goal is to make biofuel, then what people are doing in other industries outside Craig's company is taking the buzzword is a chassis, E. coli, or some other microbe, importing into it a small number of genes sufficient to put in a metabolic pathway that will make a new kind of biochemistry and then make, make a product. And that's, that's production scale at several companies, including DuPont. So it, the whole field of synthetic biology is a, is a coming thing. So we usually think about biology as a clinical applied, you know, the, like the end goal is human health. But now people have realized this is an applied science. There's applied science also sort of in materials, plastics, biofuel, what have you. Biological creatures are capable of making amazing things with their biochemistry. We don't, we don't have a, 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 a a sort of nightmare case yet, but it's definitely something to, to worry, and there's a lot of people worried about that stuff. Um, it doesn't keep me up at night. Uh, Craig's experiment, for example, was the wild type genome of mycoplasma. We don't actually know how to walk very far away from what biology has already done much more capably than us. Um, you wouldn't want to you know, sort of totally rely on our incompetence for safety. But, but right now, we're incompetent at doing things. So evolution is explored in a much wider space than us. It's probably not going to stay that way. So this field of what we should make uh, is, is something to keep an eye on. The interesting thing is, my prediction is, we would be dead. And the reason is that the whole system is evolving in a way that everything becomes interdependent anyway. So biology is a mess. It's a glorious mess. So something that starts out as an ALU sequence that inserts itself just because that's what ALU sequences do, over time, the sequence drifts, and suddenly there's a transcription factor binding site of six nucleotides. And then the system says, oh, there's a transcription factor binding site there. Well, I don't need this one, and then this one will link out of existence. And so pretty soon, the stuff that started as junk sort of gets locked in in various ways. And so the whole sort of like the analogy that people use is, my desk is covered with junk. But if you suddenly started pulling papers out, you'd spill my coffee, trash my laptop. The, the, the system becomes interdependent, even though it's filled with stuff that's essentially started as stuffer, but slowly. It, it, more like the sequence sort of, the important stuff starts spreading out in a way that it becomes very difficult to identify. So junk DNA sort of becomes a concept then. It's the observation that most of our genome, statistically speaking, seems not to be doing anything. But if you force me, put your finger on a million bases that you're willing to delete, I go, ah, I don't want to do that. But, so it's, so this, uh, and there's a difference, if you, if you see what I mean. Now, that said, experiments like that have been done. So we can take out, an experiment was published a few years ago where somebody took out, I think it was a million bases of mouse DNA uh, that actually included so-called ultra-conserved sequences. So it's almost the opposite experiment. Take the most conserved sequences in the animal and delete them and see what happens. The mouse is fine. 
Now, the problem with those kind of experiments is the mouse looks fine to you, but you know, the mouse, mouse might have had you know, an IQ of 70, and we don't know how to measure mouse IQ. Uh, so it always comes down to the, the sort of phenotype, uh, you know, how, how good our phenotypic assay is. Evolution is a much, has a much finer discrimination, we believe, than, than what we can do in the lab. Starting to work on BLT, how dangerous do you think BLT and PLR could be to the environment? So the question is about virus-like particles and other virus-like sequences that are in our genome. And this often comes up as a concern. We have one of the things on that slide was ERVs, the endogenous retroviruses. And so people, for instance, you can imagine, I'm not, this is not my area, but I have read people worrying about, well, if there's ever an HIV vaccine and we inject somebody with a vaccine, what if it recombines with the endogenous retroviruses and, and something comes out? And, and so these things, I mean, the system picks up sequence. I mean, one system will pick up sequence from another system. These are legitimate concerns about, about all this stuff. You wouldn't want to minimize them. Um, uh, something that we do tend to fall back on, though, is, is sort of incompetence in the, in the sense that uh, evolution has already, in many of the cases that we're talking about, explored the space already somewhere and, but, but, and rejected it. And, and often these things are not fit for, you know, once some recombination happens, it's less fit. But again, you wouldn't want to rely on incompetence to protect us. So that we don't know how to think about these risks, actually. Well, and the interesting thing with the FDA going bad is that, you know, you can rely on that for over, you can start people over the same time, so you can get lost. Right. And there's a lot of un unknowns. I mean, but, you know, I, 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 again, I don't, I don't stay up at night worrying about, about this stuff. The computational power of evolution, sort of back of the envelope calculations, is so incredibly enormous. The number of things on this planet, there's thought to be on the order of 10 to the 40th different cells on this planet. Every one of them has a genome. Every one of them is fighting for survival. Our computers, our laboratories are nowhere near being able to explore 10 to the 40th different different creatures. And so that's a big buffer. I mean, there's a lot of biology that's already been explored without wiping us out. So. I think that's probably wrong, and that if I knew more about transposon mutations, that you probably could find visible phenotypes in humans that were known to be caused by transposons. I know that there's people who study the effects of new transposon insertions who actually, you know, of all the mutations. So like one of the numbers is in every 20 babies, there's an average of one new transposon insertion in the genome. And then because, you know, something like one to 10% of the genome is functional, you know, something less than that will actually have some phenotype. And of course, a lot of phenotypes are gonna be visible. And they show up sort of for every gene, I guess another way to say that is, for any given phenotype, odds are the mutation that's going to show up is going to be a point mutation or a small deletion or something like that. But at a lower frequency, another cause of mutations is transposon insertion. We always want more technology. So the question is, is the, is the instrumentation, say for DNA sequencing, where we want it to be? Um, no in multiple dimensions. So one is we want that cost to go from sort of it's $5,000 per genome. We'd like to drop that to $100 per genome. There's a technology that we're all desperately hoping comes out the door called nanopore sequencing technology, for example. A tiny little molecular hole through which you pull a single strand of DNA. And as it goes through the pore, there's enough of a current difference that you can detect across because of the bit different base sizes. Uh, that you can sequence. They're having tremendous difficulty with getting this technology to work. It's very fiddly. IBM is trying to do it with synthetic, you know, physical nanopores. A company called Oxford Nanopore in England is trying to do it with biological nanopores. Oxford announced its little device two years ago and still hasn't delivered it. Um, they're having technical difficulty, but it might, there's no reason why it can't work. People believe that once we have that, we'll do another one of these jumps. There's another company called Pacific Biosciences, another technology I could describe that so there's at least two major technologies waiting in the wings to knock that curve down for DNA sequencing. But another important dimension is, like the Pacific Biosciences thing, I can't remember how much material I need. It's some awful 
I think two micrograms of DNA, which is like, I don't know, zillions of cells. So the other dimension we need this to work is we need to be able to do single cell genomics for the reasons I, I sort of ended with. And especially not just to see the genomes, but to see the transcriptome, the RNAs that are being made. And there's very little capability to see one cell's worth of RNA. And that's a business of microfluidics and what have you to be able to work with very small volumes. We need that technology to get much, much better too. So, so the story that I sort of told you would imply that the junk, the, 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 there's these mobile DNA, DNA elements that are hopping around. So the prediction that was made in the early 1980s by Francis Crick and by others was that what would account for these big genome size differences, and I probably should have said because this is the sort of punchline of the story, is different loads of those selfish elements. So if you went into the lungfish, you would find that it's 99%. It was infested by something that really junked up its genome. And that's true. So as you look, at, at least for the most part, so as you look for like closely related species of plants, one of which has a very large genome, one of which is a very small genome, invariably what has happened is the uh, large guy recently got infested with a transposon that expanded dramatically in its, in its genome. Well, accidental. I mean, the, 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 the transposon itself is alive. And so there's an ecosystem there. It's just an ecosystem that's playing out at the molecular level. The, the transposon's trying to stay alive, and our genome's trying to kill it um, for the most part. And then over time, some of those insertions, they're sequenced, and they get, they, they get adapted to, to different functions. And so we can clearly see that some of the transposons over time get co-opted. Like our immune system, for example, the, the, the things that piece together our antibody genes, the so-called genes RAG1 and RAG2 and the nucleus, things that cut DNA, those were borrowed from an ancient transposon. So we owe a good part of our immune system to that. People argue about that and, and without being able to do the experiment of like suddenly deleting a bunch of DNA or suddenly introducing a bunch of DNA. Uh, nobody's experimentally addressed the question, so there's a lot of hand waving in the field. One thing that is thought though is that the energetic cost, you would have thought, why would the system allow so much DNA to be in there? Because it must be expensive in terms of just replicating it. And it turns out, the, at least the back of the envelope calculations are that DNA replication is a relatively small cost. Uh, our, synapse, our, our, our neurons are burning a lot more energy, and our RNA and, and protein trans translation is burning another big chunk of energy, but DNA replication itself, relatively cost-free. So actually, one of the things that people believe that actually sort of makes a little bit of sense, the reason that onion cells are so big, and you can see them, or at least the nuclei are so big, is that nuclear volume scales with, with DNA mass. And so lungfish nuclei are enormous, uh, uh, onion nuclei are enormous, that we see them so well. Tyrannosaurus rex nuclei have been seen in fossils, and we actually have an estimate of their genome size because we can see, you know, because the scaling is relatively good. So there are models in the literature that says, for some reason, if you need to make big nuclei, and there's things people can imagine, maybe one of the things is you become more permissive for transposon load because you're trying to rapidly expand your genome. And those are sort of interesting ideas. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Cases of that kind of horizontal gene transfer are pretty rare in mammals. We have a lot of systems that are actually trying to block that kind of stuff from going on. Um, but we definitely do have the sequence of ancient humans. Some people may have heard that Neander several, uh, well, at least two that I know of, Neanderthal sequences have been obtained. And from those genome sequences, population geneticists have been able to measure the introgression of Neanderthal alleles into the modern human population. And there seem to have been at least two waves, one in Europe and one in Southeast Asia, over you know, 
100,000 years ago or whatever. Um, and, and so those, those kind of measurements have been made at the population level. Uh, for traits that actually have been under selective pressure, I should be more familiar with that than I am, but I think that one of the case studies that a real population geneticist would probably quote at you is the, the lactose intolerance that, ha that many people have. So the ability to digest milk came in in North, Northern Europe and the alleles for the allele necessary for digesting milk as an adult. So that is, everybody can digest milk as a kid, but normally we shut that, that gene, lactase gene off during development. The mutation that made that stay on through adulthood arose in Northern Europe, and that has also been tracked in population genetics. That's a very big deal now because now the, the because the cost of sequencing have dropped so that we can't, we don't just have one human genome, but now over the next couple of years we're going to collect about a million. We start to see that kind of population effect, and it's a big field of study right now. So I think we have to call this to an end and thank Sean again for a very stimulating lecture.